Welcome back. In this section, we're going to talk about fuses and circuit protection devices. Okay, we know that fuses should be used in every circuit to protect the wiring from overheating and damage caused by excessive current flow. Okay, we talked about short circuits earlier, and we know that when a, a wire touches a ground, either that wire is going to burn or what's protecting it has got to open the circuit. The fuse has got to burn, basically. Um, most fuses, it says many, but most fuses on a vehicle are used to protect more than one circuit of the automobile. So I may find out that my radio fuse is also powering the cigar lighter and is also powering maybe a dome light. So I can have multiple things powered off the same fuse, which really works well in diagnosing it because if I go to a car and I see that the cigar lighter is not working, but I know it's controlled by the same fuse as the dome light, and if the dome light is working, well, I know the fuse is probably good. So um, it's some process of elimination that I can do just by looking through the wiring diagram. Now, this drawing is a typical automotive fuse panel, and it's shown in figure 10.3 um, in your book on page 141. Now, this just gives you a breakdown of what the fuses are in the fuse panel, what they power. Uh, so I can go here and look at it and and pretty much figure out, well, this fuse must power, like, for example, um, this fuse. It's a white fuse, 25 amp. It powers the heater, the AC, the radio capacitor, and the deck lid. Okay. So I, so I get a breakdown of what the fuses control. Wiring diagrams will do the same thing for us, and probably a little neater. Okay. You've probably seen a lot of different types of fuses, um, but basically, the fuse is um, is a small wire. Um, a blade fuse is probably what you'll see now these days. I think there's a drawing later on, but I'll draw one now for you. It consists of two metal strips that are connected by a filament, and then insulated with colored plastic and you see that this colored plastic is standardized depending on your amperage rating of your fuse this is the color it's going to be if you look at a 20 amp fuse it's going to be yellow 25 is going to be white 15 amps going to be blue a 10 amps going to be red so on and so forth what happens is when this circuit overheats with too much current flowing through it this element is smaller than the wire that this fuse is connected to so it ends up just burning this wire out Okay, and, and this is probably, oh, look, even a better drawing than what I've done. But you see the same thing. Two strips of metal connected by a small filament. Okay, and they, and they both got ends on it, so we've got a test point. So if I'm checking this fuse and I've got a meter, I can check to see if I've got voltage here and check to see if I've got voltage here. If I do, then I know this fuse is good. Okay, because we know that there should be no resistance across the fuse. So there should be no voltage drop. And that gives me a way of checking it without having to unplug the fuse. And I want to caution you to never, never um, do a visual check of a fuse and assume that it's good. I've seen a lot of these that would burn in just a very small place down here, and you wouldn't catch it with your eye. But guess what you would catch it with? Did anybody say the ohm meter? I thought I heard that. Okay, so the ohm meter, yeah, that's definitely the best way to check a fuse. Good fuse should have continuity between these two points, or here, we're checking the same thing. Continuity between these strips. A bad fuse, of course, would show no continuity or an infinite amount of resistance between these two strips. To save spaces, a lot of vehicles use many fuses, and they work the same way, they're just a lot smaller. And your color code reading for those is written here in this PowerPoint, but also on figure 10.5 on page 142. So you can look at those and see those um, reading. And then you also see under the hood, you see maxi fuses, very large uh, versions of blade fuses that are used to replace fusible links. Um, in many vehicles. Maxi fuses are rated up to 80 amperes, 80 amperes or more. The amperage rating and corresponding color for maxi fuses are here in this chart. 
you've probably seen a maxi fuse. It's just a great big version of the other fuses that we've that we've seen. Now used a lot in the eighties, you see a Pacific fuse, and you've probably seen a lot of these on imports. Okay, it's got a short piece of wire that connects to two sides, and it's got a clear top so that you can see through it. Okay, it's used just like another fuse to protect from a direct short to ground. And of course, it's important to test the condition of a fuse if the circuit being protected by the fuse doesn't operate. Now, I've seen a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to diagnose an electrical problem that there was nothing wrong, but a fuse was bad. And a simple test like this one where he's taking the test light and he's got power on one side and he takes the test light and he probes the other terminal and he's got power on that side, well, he knows without a doubt that fuse is good. Okay, most blown fuses can be detected quickly because the center conductor is melted. So again, if I've got this fuse and this wire here has been melted and where it no longer connects, it's broken, okay, I can check it with an ohm meter and it's going to show that there's no continuity between here and here. Thus, I know that fuse is bad. Circuit breakers are also used in the automotive circuit. We're probably we're through with fuses now, but circuit breakers are also used in a. Um, they stop the current flow and open to prevent overheating and possible fire caused by hot wires or components. Some common places we see circuit breakers used in the headlamp circuit. Well, why do we want to use a circuit breaker in a headlamp circuit? Well, the answer lies in how this circuit breaker works. And we'll see that in this picture here. A circuit breaker is wired a lot like this right here with a bimetallic strip. And it looks like a big metal case inside that box. Now, what ends up happening is when too much current flows through a circuit because of a loss of resistance, the strip, the bimetallic strip inside the, the uh, circuit breaker heats up. When it heats up, it deforms and it opens up like this. Okay? And it breaks that circuit. Okay? But as soon as it opens up, now the electricity stops flowing and this bimetallic strip cools off. As soon as it cools off, it goes back down and makes connection again. So when a headlight shorts out, if it was powered by a fuse, if you're driving 55 miles an hour down the road and all of a sudden you have a short in your headlight circuit, well, boom, you've blown it, you're in the dark, and you've probably hit a tree. And we know that's not good. So if we, if we protect that fuse with a circuit breaker, now what happens is whenever that fuse shorts, now the headlights blink because of that circuit breaker, just like your signal lights do. Now, you're not going to want to drive along with blinking headlights, but at least it doesn't leave you in the dark and you can get off the road. Now, some other places that these circuit breakers are used is in some areas with electric motors that um, provide a power surge that would probably blow a conventional fuse. We use circuit breakers. You see them a lot in power seats and power door locks and windows also use circuit breakers. So if you're asked on the test where are they used, headlights, power doors, uh, power seats, power windows, you'll see a circuit breaker for a protection device there. Okay, our next type, so now we've talked about fuses, we've talked about circuit breakers. Our next type is um, power seats, power door locks, power windows. Is positive temperature coefficients, or PTC circuit protectors. Okay, so like with this, a positive temperature coefficient, you, you see these a lot used in window motors. They don't actually break the circuit, but they provide very high resistance in the circuit. Okay, so if you've got a window motor and you run it up and down and up and down and up and down and, and the window motor starts to get hot, um, what will happen is this PTC circuit protector will, will the solid state parts inside of the electronics will break down and it will cause high resistance that will no longer allow that motor to operate. So what do you do? You say, ah, oh, my window doesn't work. I release my switch. 
when I release my switch, the voltage is no longer applied to it, and the motor starts cooling off until eventually this solid state component, this PTC circuit protector, will go back to make contact again. So then you hit your switch five minutes later, and boom, the window rolls up. Okay. Then you say, well, let's fix now. I'm going to roll it down. And you roll it down, and you roll it back up again, and it stops again. And this process starts over. And that's pretty much what's going on there. Um, it's a lot, it acts a lot like a circuit breaker, but it's a little different in, in concept. Um, the electronic control unit computer used in most vehicles today incorporates thermal overload protection devices. Okay, which is a PTC type device. So your book points out that when a component fails to operate, do not blame the computer. Well, don't, let, don't let that be your first uh, suspect. Anyway, the current, uh, the current control device is controlling current flow to protect the computer. Components that do not operate directly, correctly should be checked for proper resistance and current draw. So let's say if a computer is supposed to control the injector and it's not, I don't automatically condemn that computer. I look at the injector, figure out what the resistance is supposed to be, figure out if I'm getting power to it, figure out if my sensor is supposed to be powering that injector. There's, there's a lot of checks I go through um, where a shade tree mechanic might say, oh, that computer's bad, let's throw her out. We don't want to go that route because very seldom do we actually have a, a computer, uh, a problem that is the cause of the computer itself. Now, it does happen, but it's a lot rarer than conventional wisdom would, would have you believe. Now, a fusible link is a type of fuse. It's just a short strand of wire that's covered with a non-flammable insulation. You see some good fusible links um, in your book on page 145. They look like this. Okay, we see a junction box, and you can see here that our battery, our hot positive battery cable goes here. Now, here's fusible links. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six different kinds of wire. Now basically a fusible link is four gauge sizes smaller than the wire it's protecting. Okay, So for example in your book a 12 gauge circuit is protected by a 16 gauge fusible link. It has a thick insulation which may make the wire look larger than the other wires but actually the conductors inside it are smaller than the wire it's protecting. So if we get too much current flow, if something shorts out in this, and we get too much current flow flowing through this wire, this fusible link will burn in too. Now a lot of times that burning doesn't burn the insulation. So the way we check them is we grab the fusible link wire and we pull it. It shouldn't be elastic. It should be firm. If it stretches and pulls back and stretches and pulls back, chances are that wire is broken internally. And of course there's other ways we can check it. How do I check a wire that has insulation on the outside like this, but the wire in the middle is actually broken. How do I check that? Did I hear somebody say an ohm meter? That's right, you can check for continuity across it. So a very good test on a fusible link. Fusible links are also installed as close to the battery as possible so they can protect the battery, the wiring and circuits coming from the battery. And you can see this, if I could trace the other end of that wire, it probably goes right to the battery right up in this area somewhere. So from that point on, these probably, if I were to guess, power your fuse panel inside the car or power underhood fuse center or something. But basically, um, we're protecting it so that if, if anything shorts out, the only thing that's unprotected is this short little wire back to the battery. So that works out very well. Um, now here's a demonstration showing that, and this is, let's see if this, this is in your book on page 147. Okay, it shows a functional fusible link by connecting a battery to each end with jumper cables. After a couple of seconds, smoke starts to roll out from around the insulation. After about five seconds, smoke fills the area as the wire inside finally melts and breaks or opens the circuit. The fusible link um, afterward. 
notice that the special high temperature insulation is unharmed though the copper has melted in half okay so the insulation because it's non-flammable it didn't burn into but you see the wire did break and he pulled that out now a lot of times if the wire breaks in the middle you know and these things are con and the ends are connected well you might look at the wire visually and think oh that's not broken but in that case you might spend a lot of time on a on a uh, particular circuit that might just have a fusible link problem so make sure you own these stretch them make sure that you check even though it looks visually good make sure that you're owning it and making sure that that's making connection okay um terminals and connectors which we're just about to finish up the terminal is the metal end of a wire which makes the electrical connection the term connector usually refers to the plastic portion that snaps or connects together thereby making the electrical connection so it could be said that the, the connector is the big plastic piece that looks like this and the terminals are actually the wires that are in them and this whole big thing out here is the connector Okay. So connectors, some terminals have seals and connectors that help seal the electrical connectors. Okay, we try to keep moisture and contaminants out of it. Okay. Um, because any type of moisture or rust or anything that builds into these is going to be um, hazardous to our circuit. Okay. We can separate a connector by just picking up the tab and pulling it apart. Or if it has a secondary locks, we pull those off and um, remove the wires from the connector. If we have to remove the terminal, there is a tool or a pick can be used that will release the locking tabs. And you can kind of see it here. You might not see that tank connector too well there. But you can see it in the book on figure 1017 on page 148. He's releasing a metal tab that holds that connector, uh, that holds that terminal in the connector. Um, perhaps if you had a wire that was damaged, you could stick something in there and pull that out and replace just that wire out of a connector. Now you have to be real careful doing this because you don't want to put the terminal back in a different position than it came out. I've, I've had to diagnose some of those problems and it's not fun because you don't expect to, to ever look at a terminal and, and a wire being a different place than it, than it should be. Now wire repair, um, we use solder to do it, a rosin core solder to, to connect electrical electrical solder. Okay, um, soldering makes a good resistance, uh, low resistance or resistance free sometimes electrical connection. Okay, now soldering the wire is something we're going to have to do in the shop, but it includes the following. You touch the soldering gun to the splice and you, splice and you apply solder to the junction of that gun and the wire. The solder will start to flow. Do not move the soldering gun. Just keep feeding more solder into the splice as it flows into and around the strands of the wire. After the solder has flowed throughout the splice, remove the soldering gun from the splice and allow the solder to cool slowly and you now have a good solder connection. You also have crimping terminals and they show a good soldering job um, in the book on page 1031. Okay, on, on page 1021 on page 149, figure 1021. Now crimp connectors are also shown um, on page 1023. Uh, we're also going to show you some of that in the lab. Crimping tools can be used to create a good electrical connection if the proper crimping tool is used. Okay, and there shows a crimping tool. And he also, after he crimps it, he soldered the wires together and probably used a little bit of heat shrink. Now here's a crimping seal connector. It contains a sealant and a shrink tubing in one piece. And they're not simply butt connectors. So what we're doing here is we're, we got a metal tube inside this thing. We're sticking our wire ends into it. We're crimping the wire, and then we're taking a heat gun and melting this heat shrink um, tubing around it. So what this does is it's bigger than the wire, 
but when you apply heat to it, it shrinks and it becomes a full connection around that wire. Okay, the usual procedure specified for making a wire repair to a crimp and seal is we strip the insulation from the ends of the wire about 5 sixteenths of an inch. We select the proper type of crimp and seal connector for the gauge of wire being repaired. So these aren't one size fit all, you know, certain connectors are for certain wire sizes. So we insert the wires into the splice, splice sleeve and we crimp it. Now we apply heat with a heat gun and preferably not a cigarette lighter, although that's done often. Um, but if you got a heat gun, that's a much better route to take. Um, you don't burn the insulation. Okay, and a small amount of sealant is observed around the ends of the sleeve. Okay, the left side of this crimp and seal connector has been gently crimped and heated. You see how that shrunk? And they look the same when it started, but the, the heat has caused this to sink and seal around this wire, so now moisture is not getting into it. Note how the connector has shrunk down around the wire. The heat has also released a thermal sealant that forms an effective environmental seal around the wire. So these crimp and seal connectors are very, very effective ways of connecting wires. We use those often in here. Um, now aluminum wire repair. Many automobile manufacturers use plastic coated solid aluminum wire for some body wire. Because aluminum wire is brittle and can break as a result of vibration, it is only used where there is no possible movement of the wire, such as along a floor or seal area. Okay, and this gives you the procedure for aluminum wire repair, where we're carefully stripping about a quarter inch, a little, little less than we did, a sixteenth of an inch less than we did with the copper wire. Then we're using a cr uh, crimp connector to join the two wires together. We're not soldering in aluminum wire repair. Solder will not readily adhere to aluminum because the heat causes an oxide coating on the surface of the aluminum. The splice crimp connection must be coated with petroleum jelly to prevent corrosion. Vaseline. The coated connection should be covered with shrinkable plastic tubing or wrapped with electrical tape to seal out moisture. Alright, so now let's summarize what we've learned. We've learned that the higher the AWG gauge number is the smaller the wire. We should know that. Metric wire is sized in square millimeters. The higher the number for metric wire, the larger the wire. All circuits should be protected by a fuse. All circuits. The current in the circuit should be about 80% of the fuse rating. Circuit breakers and fusible links are other circuit protection devices circuit breakers, fusible links, and fuses. They're all protection devices. Remember, protection was part of our circuit. A terminal is the metal end of a wire, whereas the connector is the plastic housing for the terminal. All wire should repair should, either, should use either soldering or a crimp and seal connector. Okay, those are the proper types of connections. So that'll summarize this week's, and we'll have a small test review before you take this week's test.